How a Narcissistic Family Gets a Child to Become the Scapegoat I talk a lot about the process of narcissistic abuse and how a child is often selected and treated as the scapegoat by the narcissistically abusive parent, but the question may remain of how exactly a narcissistic parent gets the child to identify with the role of scapegoat. When a child is selected as a source of all the family's problems, it's not enough to blame that child. Effective scapegoating involves influencing that child to believe that he or she deserves to be blamed because of being so undeserving and or defective. And in today's video, I'm going to explain how inconsistent parenting of the scapegoated child by the narcissistic family can lead to experiences for that scapegoated child, which lead them to conclude that they can do nothing right, that they do not deserve what other kids deserve, and that they feel closer to mom or dad when they act like there's something wrong with them. Well, my name is Jay Reed, and I'm a licensed psychotherapist in California, specializing in helping individuals recover from narcissistic abuse in individual therapy and through my online course and accompanying private Facebook group community. And we do this by taking a three-pronged approach that involves making sense of what happened, gaining distance from the narcissistic abuser, whether that's psychological, emotional, or sometimes physical distance, and living in defiance of the narcissist rules for living. Today's video falls under the category of making sense of what happened. And here's another good resource for making sense of what happened. If you were a scapegoat survivor of a narcissistic parent or partner, then check out my free ebook on the topic. It's called Surviving Narcissistic Abuse as the Scapegoat, and it goes into other important aspects of what it's like to be in the shoes of the scapegoated child or partner of the narcissistic abuser. From self-limiting beliefs about yourself that you must adopt in order to survive, to why the narcissistic personality is so geared to put those closest to them down. And I think along with today's video, this ebook can help you realize how none of the abuse was your fault, but was rather the product of the narcissist's own psychological and emotional problems. And you can find the link to the, to the book in the description box below or by clicking here. And if you haven't done already, I'd encourage you to hit the subscribe button and turn the notifications on so that you're alerted every time I post a new video. So how do narcissistic parents indoctrinate the scapegoated child into the role? Well, today's video draws on two important resources on scapegoating children by narcissistic parents. And I'll put the references, uh, the complete references in the description box below. But briefly, they are an author whose last name is Pilari, who wrote a book called Scapegoating in Families, and a research paper by authors Vogel and Bell from back in 1960 on how a child's emotional disturbance in, in family therapy often means they are the family scapegoat. So how does a narcissistic family convince a scapegoated child that they can do nothing right? Well, inconsistent verbal and nonverbal messages are frequently used to undermine the scapegoated child's sense of empowerment and understanding of him, him or herself and their world. You know, inconsistent messaging can take the form of showing indifference towards the negative behavior of the, of the child at some times, or getting overly punitive for that child's same behavior at other times. Because this leads the kid to conclude that no matter what they do, they'll eventually get criticized, so they must in fact deserve it. And here's an example, again, completely anonymized and fictional. But Jeremy was the scapegoat of his narcissistic family and, and recalled how family dinners could be torturous for him. By the time he was 10 years old, some nights at the dinner table would result in his narcissistic mother suddenly accusing him of bad table manners, whether it was in the form of suddenly chewing with his mouth open, putting his elbows on the table, or even speaking too loud. Other nights, she seemed to pay no attention to his same exact behavior. As a result, he was always surprised when she would attack him for these, these acts of his, and it seemed to him like he was lulled into a false sense of security and then suddenly pounced upon. I think Jeremy's experience at the dinner table highlights how inconsistent messaging from his mother about his supposedly problematic behavior prevented him from effectively changing the behavior. That if his mother really wanted him to stop these behaviors for Jeremy's own sake, then she would have been consistent in her reprimands. Of course, they could have been a lot less harsh if she did this, but um, 
And then if he had stopped these, these actions, these bad table manners, she would have accordingly been pleased. Instead, Jeremy had the impression that there was nothing he could have done to stop her from finding fault in his table manners. This contributed to his sense that he could do nothing right. Well, how does the narcissistic family convince the scapegoat child that they don't deserve what other kids deserve? Here's where double standards come into play. When a narcissistic parent treats the scapegoated child like he or she already gets too much, while giving that child in fact very little, and then goes and grants privileges and gifts generously to another child, then the scapegoated child is led to conclude that they don't deserve what that other child is getting. And at first the scapegoat child might complain and protest at this unfairness, but such expressions by the scapegoated child are typically used against that child by that narcissistic parent as evidence that that child is selfish, inconsiderate of what others need, and or takes all that they are getting, supposedly, for granted. Some scapegoated children will stop complaining when met with such humiliating responses and invalidating responses and quietly conclude that they don't deserve what that other child, you know, whether it's a sibling, a cousin, or even a child outside the home, what, what those ch uh, kids deserve. So another example, uh, again, a fictional client named, we'll call Shana, recalled in her therapy how her brother was always treated like the prince in her family, and she always seemed to be a burden and a problem to her parents. She recalled how she started working after school at age 14 and managed to save up enough money to buy a very cheap and poorly maintained car when she turned 16, while her three-year younger brother, when he turned 16 while she was away at college, um, was actually gifted a late model sports car despite him never having worked a job or contributing any money of his own towards the car. Shana recalled that when she learned of this gift towards her brother that she wasn't surprised or even uh, didn't muster any sort of protest uh, uh, to protest the unfairness of this galling act of favoritism by her parents because she was at that point so conditioned to expect her parents to respond you know, to such protests by telling her she's selfish, uh, expects too much, is, is ungrateful for all that she gets and so forth. So this tactic involves treating the scapegoated child like they deserve less than other kids and meeting the child's eventual protest with invalidation and attacks on their character. And as a result, the scapegoated kid learns to tolerate being treated like they are less deserving than the other kids and eventually then just believe it themselves to internalize it. And that's shown in Shana's kind of acceptance of what happened when her brother was gifted the sports car. So how does the scapegoat child feel closer to the narcissistic parent when that child acts like there's something wrong with him or her? Well, when a parent takes special interest in the scapegoat child's emotional or physical ailments, then the child can associate a sense of closeness with the state of being in disrepair or sort of in need of fixing. In this case, the narcissistic parent might usually pay very little favorable attention to the scapegoat child, leaving the child to suffer a pretty chronic sense of emotional deprivation and loneliness. And then those sort of painful feelings might blissfully get interrupted um, for the scapegoat child when the narcissistic parent pays special attention to them, albeit at the cost of the scapegoat child having to have something wrong with him or her. And here's an example. John survived the role of scapegoat in his family, yet again. He, he recalled how his mother would show particular interest in his skin complexion during his adolescence. She'd tell him that she saw pimples on his skin and that he seemed to be developing a bad case of acne. Uh, she'd take him to doctors who would um, tell him that they saw this as a mild case, but, um, but then she would insist when they got home that it was, it was very severe. And although this led to him feeling self-conscious and embarrassed about his appearance outside the home, he actually recalled welcoming the attention she was finally paying to him. I think John's case illustrates how a, a scapegoated child, even an adolescent, much prefers a relationship where they feel bad with a parent to no relationship at all with that parent. 
And I think these tactics often are used all together or all in alternating sequence against a scapegoated child to leave that kid feeling like there's no choice but to internalize this idea of who they are that's being imposed upon them by the narcissistic family. And once the scapegoated child comes to believe that they can do nothing right, that they deserve less than others, and that the only way to get needed closeness is to show up as if there's something wrong with them, then they can go on to live in a way that autonomously complies with the blame and accusations thrust upon them by the narcissistic family. Of course, those of you watching this video, I think have been able to preserve a part of yourself that knew or, or wanted to know otherwise about yourself. That somehow or another you held out hope you could live as you actually are rather than having to kind of go along with these artificial messages about who you are that, that just involves so much um, dis-ease within uh, in order to go along with that message. And if you were treated this way by your family, the next question might be what you can do to overcome this form of abuse. Well, I again want to recommend my free webinar on seven self-care strategies to help in recovery from narcissistic abuse. That These scapegoating tactics I've talked about today are directly challenged when you put these kinds of self-care strategies into action in your life. Because when you exercise good self-care, you're demonstrating to yourself that you deserve such care. And over time, that you can in fact care for yourself in the right way you do things correctly. And I think making these strategies into habits can go a long way towards delivering you back to your authentic and deserving self. And you can find the link to the webinar in the description box below or by clicking here. Well, thanks for watching today's video. I really hope that um, understanding some of the specific ways parents can operate, and typically this occurs unconsciously. So it can be subtle and hard to catch um, when you're in the role of the, of the scapegoat child when it's happening. And my hope is that by kind of articulating some of this and bringing to bear um, some of the research and theory in the field that's already been out there, that, that um, those tactics can kind of be seen more clearly and uh, challenged within um, for survivors who are in recovery. Well, thank you everyone for watching today's video. I'm, I'm very happy to be able to post these videos uh, each Sunday and uh, most importantly to see the, um, the comments that folks write, um, again, about the videos, uh, what's been helpful, what you'd like to see in, in other videos too, um, and also to each other. And the support and validation is just, um, I just find so uh, encouraging and heartwarming to read. Um, Okay, well, I look forward to posting next Sunday and hope everyone takes care.